welcome everyone. Welcome to another edition of Remixing Politics and Culture with me, your host, Pam. I am a public relations and marketing professional with a passion for social justice, voter advocacy, and culture. And tonight I have a special show for you. Um, let me tell you first off that um, this show actually is being dedicated to a late friend of mine um, who was a Shaw University alum, Chester Davis. He was known as the voice of Black Sports Radio. Chester created for me in the mid 90s, a public affairs show called Issues in You on WCLY Radio. And one thing that I know for certain is that he loved his beloved alma mater, Shaw University. So without further ado, like I said, this is a special show. And um, it's all about Shaw University, which is located in the capital of North Carolina, which is the city of Raleigh. Shaw is the oldest HBCU established at the oldest HBCU in the South, established by a Baptist missionary, Henry Martin Tupper, along with his wife, Sarah. And I want to make sure that we include Sarah in that because she was insistent upon having um, women, freed women, learn how to read and write as well. And so they began Shaw University teaching the formerly enslaved people how to read and write with uh, Bible studies. All right, Shaw University being 159 years old, obviously has a very rich and storied history. One particular lesson that we're going to talk about tonight is that of the 64th anniversary of the founding of the civil rights organization SNCC, also known as the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. It was organized by Shaw alum of 1927, Ella Baker, on April 17, 1960. Tonight, we are very fortunate to have uh, some wonderful guests who have direct connections with SNCC, and we're going to talk about its history. Uh, hold on one second. Okay. All right. Um, John, if you can hear me, I need you to call Dr. Forbes and, and, and let him know that his devices aren't connected, so I can't pull him up on the stage. He, you, you might need to walk him through what to do. Okay. So I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Cortland Cox. Mr. Cortland Cox is the chairman of the board of directors for the SNCC Legacy Project. He first became involved with SNCC when he was a student at Howard University. In 1963, he served as a SNCC representative on the steering committee for the March on Washington. And in 1964, he was the SNCC organizer of the 1964 Freedom Summer Project in the Mississippi Delta. I need to tell you that everybody's bios are abbreviated just for uh, brevity's sake. Later on in his career, um, Mr. Cox became a presidential appointee in the Clinton administration. Welcome, Mr. Cox, to the show. Okay, thank you for inviting me. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, our history lesson person here tonight is Professor Demetrius Noble. Professor Demetrius Noble is an activist, teacher, and radical cultural worker. He currently is the adjunct professor in the African-American and Diaspora Studies Department at UNC Greensboro. His research interests include the Black liberation struggle, Black class antagonisms, African-American literature, pop culture, and hip hop studies. Welcome Professor Noble to the show. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. So we have a few people in the chat saying hello to everyone. Okay. 
All right. So we still don't have Dr. Forbes connected just yet. Um, so I'm going to go um, to you, Prof um, Mr. Cox. Right. Tell us, tell us what SNCC was. What was it all about? SNCC was a youth organization. Uh, and most of us, we were probably between 17 and 25 years old when we were active. Mm -hmm. um, we, what we did was when, after the 1954 Supreme Court decision, Brown versus Board of Education, that said segregation was un, for, unequal and was no longer, the law could not longer be the law of the land, uh, there was massive resistance throughout the South. So young people decided that, in fact, we needed to move faster. So we engaged in the sit-ins. And your next guest, uh, Dr. Forbes, was one of the people who was at the founding meeting at, um, at, at Shaw University in 1960. Mm -hmm. I also met, worked with Dr. Forbes at the 50th anniversary of the March on March, um, excuse me, 50th anniversary of the founding of SNCC in 1970. He was the chairperson of the organizing committee and was, it was, we were very successful because we expected maybe 400 people to attend the, the 50th anniversary conference and we had 1400 people there at Shaw. Wow. So I, I wanna say something about Shaw that's, I mean, I think is important, not only in terms of SNCC, but in terms of black universities, they weren't black universities then, we were called Negro University, Negro Colleges. Negro Colleges. Negro Colleges. And sure, I mean, I attended Howard University. You know, friends of mine attended various things, Southern and so forth. During the sit-ins, which we started, I mean, SNCC was actually a coordinating council of students who were on various Negro colleges across the country, whether with North Carolina a and North Carolina Central, whether we're talking about Dillard, whether we're talking about Morgan State, so forth. So we, so, uh, so the court or meeting was to get us together and say, look, if you're going to have an impact in the country, you know, Ella Baker said, Miss Ella Baker said, you need to get together and act as students. And he, what's really important is that most black colleges or Negro colleges at the time would not allow us even to meet as individual operations on the college campuses. It was only Shaw University that allowed us to meet and have this big organizing coordinating session. So, yeah. because, so if, if, if that were not for sure, I'm not sure SNCC could have existed because what Negro college presidents and so forth were doing, if you were caught in a sit-in and so forth, they kick you out of school. Really? In our university, we have the group called the Nonviolent Action Group. Uh -huh. we, we did never met one day on Howard's campus. We had to meet at the Catholic University, uh, the Catholic uh, Church's meet off campus facility. So I must say, I will take my hat off to shore on every issue because they were brave in a very, very dangerous time when, in fact, to, 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 really even have people like us on the campus was dangerous. They would cut off funds. And Shaw University in 1960, in the midst of that, was able to bring people from around the country and maintain the integrity of what we see today. Wow, wow, wow. So tell me, as a student, as a young student at Howard University, what made you decide to join SNCC? Mr. Cox. You know, you know, we started, you know, I started, I got to Howard University, I was 19 years old. Okay. And, and, and what, for me, the most important thing is we were coming up and watching our black and white TV and reading Jet Magazine. The mm -hmm. most important thing for my generation was the murder of Emmett Till. Mm -hmm. I was 14 years old at the time and Emmett Till was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. And we saw the gruesome figures and the gruesome mm -hmm. face in Jet Magazine, and I was, I remember riding the subway in New York, and I said to myself, if that could happen to him, that could happen to me. And then I saw 
you know, the, the black women every day in 1955 in Montgomery, you know, walking as opposed to saying, I'm going to be, you know, ride the, the, the back of the bus. We, they were determined to do it. And then I watched Little Rock, what happened in Little Rock, Arkansas. So my sense is while I, while I took action, you know, and supported the demonstrations, sit-ins and the freedom rights when I got to Howard, my mm -hmm. mind was being made up over a five-year period, looking, starting when I was 14 years old, with mm -hmm. what happened with Emmett Till. Wow, 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 wow. D can you tell us, um, tell us something about the freedom rides and the activities that you did with SNCC? Yeah, so we, you know, it's interesting. People, when we talk about the sit-ins, Mm -hmm. You know, people think of, only think about, you know, a lot about the South, but a lot of our activities were in, in Washington, D.C., because the football team was segregated. You know, they, they, still, they were housing segregation in, in Washington, D.C., and Baltimore, and so forth. So they, we, we engaged as students. We would go to class in the daytime, and then actually we would then – do two or three things. First, we would either pick it, and I remember the one of the first pickets we had was the AKAs. We got them to go down and pick it in front of the White House, and they all had mink coats on and high heels. I mean, I think they, they, they knew later on that was not probably the way to dress. Uh -huh. The other thing that we did, and, and at that time, Stokely Carmichael and I were in class, and he was a member of NAG and Ed Brown and so forth, uh -huh. And what we would do to get students to go demonstrate with us, especially if we went into Baltimore and to the Eastern Shore of Maryland, we would say to the students, you know, we are going to go demonstrate, but after the demonstration, we're going to have a party. So some people went to be serious at a yeah. demonstration. Some people went for the party. But we used all the organizing skills that we could to try to get people to, to, to go to the various sit-ins in Washington Maryland, Baltimore, Maryland, the Eastern Shore. Mm -hmm. On the Freedom Rides, we what I did mostly was picket Greyhound and Trailways. Those two, the two bus stations that I picketed, you know, in support of the people who were going down south. People like John Lewis, Diane Nash, Stokely Carmichael, you know, uh, Bill Mahoney. People who were, I mean, literally and absolutely brave going into that environment because there is a and then there is this story that, you know, is told, particularly about Diane Nash. Mm -hmm. So they told <clears throat> for the federal government, the Department of Justice, the lawyer from the Department of Justice called Diane Nash up and said to her, look, these people in Mississippi plan to kill you. Uh -huh. Not going to Freedom Rides. She said, we are going to go on the Freedom Rides and, and we have already made out our wills. So people were literally prepared to die in that situation. And that was particularly important because all the adults in the room, James Farmer, Martin Luther King, all these people, they yeah. got intimidated by the level of violence. And it was the young people in SNCC, John Lewis, Diane Nash, you know, uh, Bevel, all these people who decided to break the cycle of violence and begin to allow us to continue to demonstrate in the United States. Wow, that is something. That is something. So what was the experience like for the Mississippi Freedom uh, Summer? What was that like? Oh, that was, that was very important. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I don't think, you know, one of the things that's interesting, right? You hear when you listen to the radio, particularly for liberal radio, MSNBC or or liberal, you know, t like liberal television or radio, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Everybody fears a dictatorship in the United States. Or oh, there's a, you know, if so and so wins, if MAGA wins, there's going to be a dictatorship. There's going to be, you know, all our rights taken away, all that sort of stuff. Yes. Mississippi, everything that they project for the future was Mississippi. <laughs> I mean, we had no rights there. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically, literally that the black man had no rights that a white man need respect. I want to just give you a little set. So before Freedom Summer, uh, three of the uh, civil rights workers, Cherney, Schroener, and Goodman were killed. 
Yes. Uh, and they were murdered. And they they were looking for they when they went looking for them because we created such a hubbub, you know, people got very nervous and the federal government got involved and they decided that they would drag the Mississippi River, you know, looking for the bodies. Mm -hmm. What happened was that there were so many black bodies that were being drug up from the Mississippi River, they mm -hmm. decided to just leave it alone. Because in Mississippi at that point in 1964, they could just shoot you. And we, you know, I mean, you know, even if a white man killed you, there was no way he would be, you know, convicted by any jury. He wouldn't even be arrested because, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, and I mean, like Sam, you know, black people were working in, in the cotton fields. You know, they will work from what they call from sun up to sun up to sundown. Yes. For 12 hours a day, they got $2.50 a, a day. Mm -hmm. You know, and 50%, 50 cents of that 250 had to be given to the white man who provided the bus for them to go to the fields. So they literally were working for nothing in, in, that, in that circumstance. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, for example, you know, what you saw in Mississippi, if you were, you had a household and you were trying to get goods, you mm -hmm. know, and they would kind of lend you credit and, you know, it was exorbitant rates because mm -hmm. you needed to feed your family. And mm -hmm. one thing you could not do, well, there are two things you couldn't do. They didn't want you to do. They didn't want you to vote mm -hmm. because that would mean power. And they did not want particularly black men to look and white women because they, for, in their whole view, this was a violation of their, their sacred trust. Right. So being in Mississippi was really everything that you hear people say they fear about a MAGA administration existed mm -hmm. in Mississippi at that time. Wow, that is something, that is something. So what did, you know, one of the things that um, that I read about Ella Baker was that she wasn't down with the hierarchical uh, oh. personality type of leadership and it trickled down to the, uh, b beneath her. It was about being up, so. Miss Baker was the most important thing, person in our lives. She, her basic philosophy was strong people don't need strong leaders. She did not believe that, you know, that people needed to be told what to do from the top. They said, if you give people a chance, you know, to do what is necessary, they will do what is necessary. She also told us, particularly as young people, and when we were engaged in the sit-ins, she said, what you're doing is much more than a hamburger. You know, okay. even if you get the hamburger, even if you get the hot dog, that's not going to be enough. You need to think beyond that. You need to think beyond that reality. Uh -huh. Okay, it's a good one. Okay. Okay. Uh, they've, got, <laughs> they've got Dr. Forbes on. <laughs> okay. I, I'm sorry, um, Mr. No, 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 no. No, I, I, you know, I, I haven't seen him in 14 years. It's good to see him. <laughs> okay, I'm going to introduce him. Hey there, Dr. Forbes. <laughs> Hello. Hello. We are so glad to have you on. Your your colleague, seen colleague Cortland, um, has been taking things over for you. Wonderful. Um, He's done a good job. I, I, I followed him. Thank you, uh, Cortland. Wait a minute. You still the man. Uh huh. He he is. Get him off. You're on mute, baby. Wait a minute. I'm trying to get you no, off mute. Oh, okay, no, I lost your nose. No, he's fine. He's still there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wait thank you. There you go. He's on. He's good now. Thank he's you. Good. Okay. Can y'all hear me? Oh, we can hear you. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, let's see, what was I gonna let me introduce you for hold on. Okay, so you <laughs> guys, this is a live show, things happen. Okay, so Dr. Dave Reverend Dr. David Forbes is a Shaw alum of the class of 1962. He calls himself the son of Ella Baker 
because he actually met her in 1960 when SNCC was established at Shaw University. He emerged to become a leader in SNCC and Dr. Forbes has served as interim dean of the Shaw University Divinity School. Welcome Dr. Forbes to the show. Thank you very much, Pam. I'm sorry that we've had some technical difficulty in joining you. Okay, no problem, no problem. Um, uh, this is how, we know how to flow. We know how to ebb and flow, right? So Absolutely. Dr. Forbes, tell us, please share with us your experience in meeting Ella Baker and um, just tell, share with us that story. Ella Baker, who was a graduate alumnus of Shaw University, came to the mm -hmm. university and asked um, after the February um, first sit-ins at a and about having a conference to bring all of the students from across the South together. And the president of the university asked me to serve on the committee with her to set mm -hmm. up that Easter 1960 conference. And mm -hmm. um, it was during that time that I got to know her and talk with her. And um, the rest of it has been history. Mm -hmm. I've known her ever since. A wonderful woman, as Cortland indicated, who was very much committed to seeing that um, down up leadership would lead the movement rather than top down. Um, mm -hmm. She was very, very instrumental in getting us as students together. I can hardly mm -hmm. believe that it's been that long ago. Thank you, Cortland, for the wonderful job that you did in telling the story. It's been a minute. <laughs> but you two have seen each other. That's something. That is something. Um, why did you, why did you join uh, SNCC, Dr. Forbes? Why did you join it? Um, in order to be able to appreciate um, the beginning of SNCC, it re requires us to go back to the 1950s and 60s to see mm -hmm. where we were as a people. Mm -hmm. um, segregation was the law of the land. Uh, there was segregation in schools. There was segregation in every area of life. And um, some of us, somehow, I believe by the grace of God, had a belief that it was important for us to do what we could to see that segregation would not remain. And um, it was that impetus that found us seeking to turn around, um, whether at the lunch counters or in employment or in any area of life, um, mm -hmm. that we'd be able to see things better. Um, so if you are old enough to remember the 40s and 50s and 60s, you'd be able to appreciate that it was important that we reach out and try to make changes. And we were fortunate. Uh, I was 19 and 20 at that time to have a person like Ella Baker who could shepherd us and get us to see that we did not have to stay with things as they were. Mm -hmm. And to be brave enough at that age, I guess, you know, they say God takes care of fools and babies. So, <laughs> you well, know, those were such dangerous times to do what you all did to. to, it, to was very it, it was very dangerous, but mm -hmm. fortunately, uh, I had parents and Cortland and others had parents at that time who recognized that. Mm -hmm if there were not some risk to try mm -hmm. to make a difference, that things would remain as they were. Right. One thing that Mr. Um, Cox said that, that struck me, he said how Shaw University was open to you guys organizing right there on campus 
and whatnot. And he was at Howard University and they could not organize on campus. So um, can you can you speak to that, Dr. Forbes? Um, I am always been convinced that it was God who intervened with the leadership of the university and mm -hmm. the faculty. Uh, mm -hmm. I never had any sense that there was um, any difficulty among the faculty and the administration in seeing that we did what we did. Um, it, it just never happened. Somehow, the same God who prepared us as students to see what we needed to do had the administration to see that we needed to do what we had to do. Amen to that. Amen to that. So, Professor Noble, I want to tie all of this together of the past and, and how SNCC was organized and how, um, how the brilliance of Ella Baker and mm -hmm. her strategy and what have you to today. I'm assuming that in your classroom at UNC G Greensboro, mm -hmm. you are teaching the students about SNCC and all the civil rights organizations. Are you finding the students come to you with some knowledge of these organizations or are they just hungry to learn? What What is it like in the classroom teaching this? Subject? So first of all, thanks again for having me. And I really appreciate this question. Mm -hmm. uh, overwhelmingly, and unfortunately, <laughs> what I find is that the students don't have a good working knowledge um, of civil rights struggle, right? They understand there was a civil rights movement. Of course, they're familiar with folks like uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. They've heard of Rosa Parks. They know of Malcolm X. Um, but these are surface level understandings and engagements. Mm -hmm. And some of the more particular type histories um, that Brother Cox and Dr. Forbes have offered, um, they're not aware of. And so they are hungry um, to learn this. I think one thing that's really crucial that they have both pointed out that I think is one of the most important interventions of SNCC uh, and one of the visions of Ella Baker is the focus on a bottom up type of leadership, right? The yeah. understanding that folks out in the field mm -hmm. leading grassroots organizing in these particular campaigns are the folks mm -hmm. who have a particular type of knowledge of what they're understanding as they both alluded to understand the danger right in particular type of ways that folks you know maybe in the atlanta office or somewhere else may not understand if they're not out on the ground organizing these types of campaigns in my studies of SNCC, one of the things I also think is a particularly important intervention is the focus on democratic centralism, right? Like that they wanted to make sure that there was a consensus amongst the students and amongst the folks organizing in the field for the precise reason that their lives depended on it, right? They needed to be in agreement <laughs> on the tactics, on the strategies, because a wrong calculus, a wrong analysis could could mean someone's life and mm -hmm. so i think this type of focus on the bottom of leadership on bringing in folks who understand the work from that actual practice in the field organizing each other organizing lay people in a community radicalizing them trying to galvanize them towards the goals to be achieved are incredible contributions that mm -hmm. snick offers to the civil rights movement and to black liberation struggle um, going forward. What you see happen with SNCC is they may have started off as kind of like a youth movement of the wing, but they really become the left center of the civil rights movement. They are to the left of Dr. King, right? And, and in many ways, he is running to catch up to these young folks, right? They have a, they have a political imagination that is hungrier, right? That is bolder, that is more courageous in terms of the tactics that they're willing to pursue to try to achieve 
justice uh, and equality. So I, I think you see from that, that frontline struggle, that tenacity and courage that they have, mm -hmm. um, a movement that propels the whole civil rights movement further to the left and eventually ushers us into the black power phase of black liberation struggle. Right. Right, right. You know, I wanted to to share with the audience um, this this strategy, this uh, these statistics. SNCC really transforms politics with an increase in black elected officials in southern states from seventy two in nineteen sixty five to three hundred and eighty eight in nineteen sixty eight in three years. That's like over 200% increase. They were we need it now. We need we need we need boots on the ground like that now today. That is phenomenal. And so I, I I was doing some research and I thought it was interesting about how they said that um because I guess it was Stokely Carmichael, was it? Yeah, chairman of SNCC in Lowndes County that he was talking about black power and, and then they had decided in December, was it 1966, that they didn't, they didn't want any more white workers to be in SNCC. And so they didn't want to allow them to participate. But so talk about that a little bit, that when, when things started changing more in the, for, as a history lesson. Yeah, I mean, I think we need to be very, I mean, it seems to me one of the things that we started to say, and and that was not something in that a change, you know, started back in 1966 or something like that. It mm -hmm. started before that. Mm -hmm. I mean, and basically, one of the things that SNCC encouraged whites to do was create the it was called SOC. I think it's Southern some Student Organizing Committee. Mm -hmm. Because we said, look, the problem that we face is not in the black community. The mm -hmm. problem we face is in the white community. Uh -huh. You know, your cousins, your father, <laughs> your, your, your uncles, you know, you, you got to talk to them. Uh -huh. I mean, talking to us is nice and, you, you know, it's safe. But if we're going to, you know, go up against that, we need allies in the places where these decisions are getting made. So mm -hmm. my sense is that one of the things that you know, the basic thrust behind it is was, in fact, you know, move move the white community, white kids, uh, a lot of them who came down. I, I think for Freedom Summer, we had over probably 900 and close to 1,000 volunteers. Mm -hmm. You know, and our point to them is now you're here, you've seen what the realities are. Go back to your communities and make a difference. Now, some did and went to various places. You know, place some people went back, for example, students from the elite schools, you know, Mario Savio went back to, to Berkeley and did, you know, a number of things. You know, some of the, the white kids from the South went various places and some, some of the organizations still exist. Mm -hmm. So my sense is that, and, and let me just say this one thing about it. This country has a very, while we, we, I, they're having a very hard time dealing with the concept of black people in power. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was the, I mean, when Stokely talked about black power in June of 1966, it was viewed as quote racist. I mean, mm -hmm. and when you look and it's very hard, the professor can tell you, it's very hard to find any positive things about black power in the history books because that is the one thing that cannot be tolerated. Black people engaging in their own view of the world. I mean, and let's look, think about it. You know, after Black Power, when we, and, and Dr. Forbes can tell you, you know, we used to have conquering, right? We used to conquer our hair. Yeah. You know, make it straight like that. We used to like bleach, our, you're trying to be like used to bleach our skin, you know, to get it white. We used to, you know, close our nose and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then we started wearing Afro. I mean, just we wore Afros and stuff. And, and this is, you know, and let me just tell you how deep it is. I don't remember in 1928 when Obaka, Barack Obama and Michelle Obama were elected and somebody had them doing a fist bump on, on today. And it was viewed as a threat. I remember. It was viewed as a threat. 
So, I mean, my sense is that one of the things that's very important for us is that those who, and Ms. Baker points out, those who suffer the problems need to have the power to present solutions. You know, and, and, and this country, it's very difficult. That's what MAGA is about. MAGA is about we cannot have other power centers among ourselves. We want to go back to what Dr. Forbes talked about in, you know, 1945, 1950, when, you know, there were no rights that a black man or black woman had that a white man would respect. That's where they want to go back. The question mm -hmm. where the power, where does the power center e exist in this country? And I think that's really important thing for us to understand. Right, right. Professor Noah. Yeah, but into that. No, I, I I think he's right on the money, right? So, what we see represented in terms of modern day American political theater is we're we're not even on the brink. We we've arrived at fascism, right? So, what he's talking about in terms of like where are the centers of power? What are they are? Um, violently trying to alienate and marginalize into the shadows and shrink power is from not only uh people of colors but people of color and black folks with a particular type of politic right so anyone who has a leftist vision for the world anybody who has a vision that says we need to redistribute wealth and power anyone who's advancing for workers rights and for the least of these and the most vulnerable are most definitely considered a threat and i think uh it, it, the rhetoric certainly says that they, they're they're going after folks that have these types of um political imaginations we're, we're living through a genocide right now and if you're bold enough to call it a genocide they're, they're coming after you right yeah, yeah. They, they made dr gay step down from her her post of uh, at harvard there's all sorts of folks that are being persecuted for willing to speak truth to power as they say so i think um uh, uh, brother cox is right on the money um you know with that analysis which means there's all the more urgency right now in terms of like how we uh strategize to fight and try to, to mobilize and resist against that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i've got this one question in the chat that I, I hope one of you will answer maybe dr forbes and or mr cox how can women and blacks fight together now we were split against the bs then I'm assuming how, can, women, women, go ahead, how go ahead. can women and blacks fight together now? And I think I think Shoei Howie is a Caucasian lady, I believe. Um, we are split against the BS then. Back then, I think that's what she's saying. I would think that it's important for everyone in the movement to understand the nature of oppression. And oppression is not just for or against black people, but it's against women, it's against gays, mm -hmm. it's against anybody who does not conform to the expectation of the majority. I mm -hmm. think it's important that we join hands. And um, I would think that if there's any contribution that SNCC can make, it's mm -hmm. that there needs to be at every major juncture, our colleges, mm -hmm. our Greek letter organizations, an effort to teach um, what necessitated the establishment of SNCC. Because what mm -hmm. is what necessitated the establishment of SNCC exists right now. It, 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 yes. it, it's not just the 1950s and 60s and 70s, but it's right now. So somehow right. there needs to be uh, an effort to teach. Um, um, Professor Noble indicates um, that at the college level, uh, there needs to be some effort to see that our young people can learn what brought us where we are and what brought us 
to where we are can take us to where we need, need to go. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've got one more. It, uh, uh, it's to you, Mr. Cox. She's Danielle Purifoy says, I, she, she just heard you talking about attempts to recover black murdered and missing people from the Mississippi and it being called off. What might we do now to try recording and remembering people? Yeah, there the are two things. Um, the first is that one of the things that we did for the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Summer of, 19, of, um, of, of 1964 is we created a listing of all the people who were murdered and martyred in Mississippi that we could find. We did the research. Uh, and if, if I could, I, I mean, I, I can send her or whoever this is, you know, a listing that, you know, exists um, so that, you know, we have that. One of the things that we created that we know that's important and I hope people spend time going to, it was, they should go to SNCC, SNCC legacyproject.org. And there, there's information. We have over 20,000 documents about various things, various aspects of the movement. You know, for example, you know, Dr. Falls, one of the things you'll know is everybody who was at the, um, who was at the founding meeting at Shaw is listed in the, in, in, in the, on the, on the uh, digital movement platform. Uh, mm -hmm. We have, we have pictures of a number of people who were there. So we not only have their names, we have their pictures. Uh, we have, you know, everybody who was ever in SNCC was listed. Everybody who was in the Freedom Rides, you can find the information. We, we have tremendous amount of information there. Mm -hmm. So I just so my sense is that we do have it. Uh, if they wants to contact us, SNCLegacyProject.org, that'll be helpful. I just want to emphasize one other thing that David said that's important. The big fight for us is minority rule versus majority rule. It is not just black and white. It's those who want to have minority rule run over majority rule. And the question before is one of the big things that, you know, all of us need to be engaged in is this whole issue of what's going on on the question of choice. I mean, we everybody needs to be very clear about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so listen, I have, I, I hope our audience has thoroughly enjoyed this history lesson. And I want you all to remember it all started at the HBCU Shaw University. And so we're going to make a bit of a transition in the show right now. I am going to bring up two other very important guests um, this evening. As we've traveled down from our history lessons about SNCC and Shaw University, it's time to welcome the 18th president of Shaw University, Dr. Paulette Dillard. She is a scientist, educator, and astute businesswoman. Uh, she is uh, an astute businesswoman. She is the proud HBCU graduate three times over, having degrees from Barbara Scotia, Tennessee State, and a PhD in biological sciences from Clark Atlanta University. She did attend Belmont University, a PWI, and received her <laughs> MBA. <laughs> but she's, H she's HBCU strong, that's for sure. Welcome to the show, Dr. Dillard. Good evening and thank you. Absolutely. I have enjoyed so much and I can tell from our chat, people have enjoyed this history lesson about Shaw University, its establishment of SNCC, I will, and then to learn from Dr. Cox that how Shaw University even then was so much, was different in that they allowed these things to happen on their campus that they weren't afraid. The presidents weren't afraid back then. They said, go ahead, do it, kids. Go ahead. Okay. I want to also bring up one other person. Um, and this is our generation. I believe Zade is Generation Z. I think. I think she is. Um, this is Zade Steele. 
Um, she is the current Student Government Association president. Zaid is an aspiring civil rights lawyer and is currently an intern for the North Carolina House of Representative A. Jones. Welcome to the show, Zaid. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. So, ladies, we're going to talk a bit, and gentlemen, as we get into the conversation, you can chime in. Okay, so Dr. Dillard, Shaw University has an incredible 159-year history. But what is the one thing that Shaw needs that it can't get enough of? Money. <laughs> Money. So here's an opportunity. I'm going to put up on the screen an opportunity where all of us, all, all a l l all of us can help participate in helping shaw university stick and stay around another 159 years and also it's so important for i don't care where you went to school to support our hbcus period full stop right zay yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right that's right so i'm going to pull this up um i'm going to uh share my screen i have let's see here it is there it is do you see it yeah. you all see the share day of show you day of giving flyer yes okay okay so um dr dillard please tell us about the show you day of giving uh if you haven't noted already the Shaw U Day of Giving in 2024 happens to fall on Juneteenth. Oh. And we think that is significant in that Shaw is continuing to do the work that it was doing in April of 1960. And that is providing an opportunity for anyone uh, who wants an education to have that opportunity and also to continue to make a Shaw U difference in the world. And SNCC is what we, one of the many attributes of Shaw University that we are so proud of, but there are so many others. Mm -hmm. But people tend to think all of Shaw's accomplishments are in the past. Mm -hmm. We are still doing amazing things at Shaw University. Mm -hmm. And we need your support to continue to make a difference. Absolutely. Uh, we have launched the Center for Racial and Social Justice to live out the dream of SNCC. We have students that are engaged in a number of community activities to make a difference. And we are not shying away from our position on Black power, Black excellence, and we will forever be known for those kinds of programs. But as has been discussed, the movements that are going on today, the MAGA movements are all designed to disenfranchise Black excellence. Yes. And as long as we are totally dependent upon funding from outside of our community, the danger of having it dictated to you what you can and cannot do. We will not allow that at Shaw University. So on Juneteenth, mm -hmm. we need you to support Shaw University like you never have before so mm -hmm. that Professor Noble, we can continue to tell the true story mm -hmm. of Black excellence. Right. To Cox and Dr. Forbes, we want to and we intend to continue this work. But we know that the success of SNCC and other organizations depended upon our people coming together and making it happen. And Shaw University is asking you to come together and help us continue the legacy that began long before Ella Baker and 1960 yes. uh, with the formation of the first year, first four year medical curriculum 
on any campus, white or black. Mm -hmm. so medical schools, law schools, pharmacy schools, Shaw mm -hmm. University's legacy, educating women by building a dormitory in 1873 to educate women on a college campus. Those things came because we had a brave leadership from our founder, you know, to to each of our presidents, and we are not shying away from that. And we want you to join us in making um, a difference in our current world and all that we are trying to accomplish. Dr. Dillard, um, will in the day of giving on Juneteenth, can people who work at places where companies will match um, the employee contribution, are they able to contribute that way through um, your day of giving? Absolutely. Okay. Now, I, I, we, we have set up where um, we allow you to provide the information and we will definitely take uh, employee matches. We will take um, everything from a dollar to a million dollars. <laughs> uh, so you can give in any capacity um, you so desire. Absolutely. Well, wonderful. And so all of you in the chat, I hope that you heard that. Uh, Juneteenth is also Shaw's day, uh, their day of giving. And you have learned one of the wonderful, great history lessons of their past, their um, anniversary, their 64th anniversary of SNCC being founded is um april 17th this week and um we, we have learned a wonderful history lesson from dr forbes mr cox and i don't know where professor noble went but he i hope he didn't think he had to get off the off the screen so back to our gen zier zade all right zay you are shaw's future congratulations on your upcoming graduation I'm so excited for you. I know that you're active in politics, working as an intern for Representative A. Jones in Raleigh. Just it's almost walking distance for you to get there, right? Almost. Almost. Yes, it is. Okay. Mm. So what does it mean to you to attend a university such as Shaw with its such with, with an incredible rich legacy? And you're not from North Carolina. Tell us where you're from, Zay. Yes, so I am originally from Kansas City, Missouri, the home of the real barbecue, if you ask me. <laughs> um, but to attend Shaw University, I would have to say it's been a blessing. I work, um, I would kind of consider my, I would, I think I'm a little bit similar to uh, Miss Baker because she worked underground and that's really how I became where I am today with the SGA president. I kept myself involved. I kept myself surrounded in the conversations that needed to be talked about to help better our institution. Like you said yourself, Shaw University has a lot of history that, that needs to be get, uh, given to our community. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Like I said, I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. We don't, ha we have a HBCU called Langston, but even in my real area we don't hear about HBCUs so mm -hmm. for me to attend one I feel like it's important for me to keep the legacy going of all leaders that came before me and teach my fellow peers and my family back at home why it's important to make sure we're investing in our HBCUs because that's the only connection that we have to our history if you want to learn about Ella Baker, Martin Luther King, um, Bernard Rustin you have to read you have to go to HBCUs to pick up that history Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Cox, you have any words of wisdom for um, Zade Steele, our, our upcoming graduate at Shaw University? You're muted, sir. I would like to make a commitment first. Uh, if we get the information, if I, if we can get the information from somebody uh, sure, we will send out to our mailing list uh, the, the, uh, the, the notice for June 19th. Uh, so we would need to, I mean, I, uh, I, 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 I'm not sure how we do it in this situation. Maybe we'll reach out through the way we did it, Pam, so that if we can get a contact person so that we can get the information on time to, to send out to our mailing list. The other thing we'll commit to do 
is also put the 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 notice about the fundraiser on our digital platform so that in fact you know people who will come to that site you know and that we will see you know let people know and, and inform them about how they can support because you know we know you know that we owe a lot to Shaw. I mean Shaw has a special place in our heart. We owe Shaw and anything we can do for Shaw we will do. So that is so if I if I get the commitment, if I get the contact person, we will follow up to do the mailing and probably need to do it sometime around June, the first week of June or something like that. We'll so I have that. Yeah. Um, Mr. Cox, John just told me, um, sent me a text that um, that he will he'll be the connector to make sure that you all have that information. OK, well, that's good. I mean, me so because it seems to me that we owe that and, and we need to we owe that to show. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think for f I think for the young, per uh, you know, I think I tell young people all the time, mm -hmm. we need them to succeed because if they fail, we have failed. Yes. You know, we they we you know we are part, and you know David Forbes knows just as as well as we do as you know as I do, you know we we stand on the shoulders of people like A. Philip Randolph, mm -hmm. W. E. D. B. Du Bois, you know. Harriet Tubman. I mean, we are part of that legacy, that long gray line. And it is our responsibility to continue intergenerational conversations, begin to have whatever kinds of support systems in place that we can afford so that young people can take it to the next level. Because, mm -hmm. you know, even one of the things that's very humbling to understand is even though we were very successful in a lot of things and they were necessary, we know they're not sufficient. And therefore not knowing knowing that they're not sufficient and other generations will have to carry it on is our responsibility. So back to the commitment again. So we will do the mailing to, to ask people, the people in our mailing list to support Shaw's efforts. Absolutely. Dr. Forbes, you have any words of wisdom for our upcoming your upcoming alum, uh, Zaid Steele, Dr. Forbes, she's 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 doing big things already. You have any words of wisdom for her? Shaw University uh, has been a blessing, not a, only in my life, but in the history of our people. And I thank God that I learned that not only are we the beneficiaries from our people, but there have been great people like Dr. Henry Martin Tupper and his wife, Sarah Tupper, who made a sacrifice and Shaw was built upon sacrifice and other HBCUs. And it's gonna take sacrifice to catapult Shaw to where she needs to be. I'm very proud of my president, Dr. Dillard, uh, who serves us very well. And um, I invite everybody who is under the sound of my voice to plan to make a contribution uh, by Juneteenth to Shaw University. But don't stop there. Make a plan to continue to support Shaw to be all that she can be. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Purifor, for your yes. leadership and for uh, Cortland and the others who have been on the program tonight. Thank you. I want you all to know, if you would please share this video so that we can disseminate the information far and wide um, to, for people to learn some wonderful, wonderful history on Shaw University in SNCC. It's nothing like getting it firsthand. It's not in a, it, what you saw was not in a book. It was from people who actually lived it and know it. And then to have a, a professor to help chime in and, and, and talk about what it is that he's teaching in his classroom and adding context to it. Zaid, our future leader, our future civil rights lawyer, all of those things. I, listen, I expect great things from you. You're already doing great, right? Already, right, Dr. Diller? <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. 
Yeah, and so our contributions help students like Zaid and others to continue their education. Um, it takes a lot to keep up a building, keep up buildings and all of those good things. So, um, it's, okay. So I'm just, I'm just, John is sending me texts and I'm trying to wrap up too. So anyways, <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to wrap up with how can we build upon um, what was started in 1960? Dr. Dillard, I go, I go to you first. We, we, are, we are constantly building on what happened in 1960 with the emphasis being on a point that um, Mr. Cox made. It was from the students. Mm -hmm. And so the student engagement is what we are promoting at Shaw University. We are saying this is your campus. You know, what do you want to be your legacy? Our students are involved in voting initiatives. Mm -hmm. And Zaid has been very active on that front. Mm -hmm. uh, she conducted a seminar on, you know, the impact of gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. And these are the conversations we have all the time and we invite the community. We had the courageous conversations after the George Floyd killings, you know, and, and so we continue to have a campus where we're inviting those conversations, even if they're uncomfortable. We are also doing things like we're out in the community. We're promoting things like home ownership, mm -hmm. you know, financial literacy, you know, we take our community engagement very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. And that's all because of, you know, Shaw University exists not only for its mission with its students, but its community and its broader work. And we intend to continue to do that. And that comes with providing an environment for students where they can be exposed to the Mr. Cox, the Dr. Forbes, you know, all of those individuals because they can hear our history firsthand. First and they can make their own decisions about what needs to be done in the world. And everybody doesn't have that ability. And I thank God every day for Shaw University because I think that is what our role is to keep telling the truth, speaking truth to power. And that's what our DNA is all about. All right, Zaid, I'm going to let you wrap it up being our Gen Z and future graduate and all of that and our future. You, you tell us, how are we <clears throat> building upon what was started with SNCC in 1960, for sure? Using our voices. One thing I can say about my generation is we use our voices. We understand how important it is to use them. Our voices hold power. I think that we're moving out of the hush, hush, be quiet, keep it at home, but we can't do that anymore. If there's a problem, we need to fix it. And you know, I've spent I've spent my year being an SGA president making sure that students are knowing how important it is to vote. And meeting where they're at, because I, we also have students who, who didn't grow up with knowing how important voting is and mm -hmm. how it can affect their lives. But we also grew up on having dreams, on having a land, buying a house, owning a house, making mm -hmm. sure the education in our student that our kids are, will have is efficient for them to succeed in life. You know, and I love what, mixed, what Mr. Uh, Cortland said, you know, even though they worked so hard, some of the things weren't efficient, but they started it. And it's part of my generation to finish it. You know, so for for us to keep SNCC going on is just to keep voicing our keep voicing our voices, knowing that we have power, getting out in the community. Like Dr. Diller said, Shaw University is in, is in downtown Raleigh. We have a diversity surrounded around us, and it's important for us to hit all of those cultures and those communities and mm -hmm. teach them about our history here at Shaw University because we do have a lot to give. And it's also important to make sure that we keep bringing our history to people who are actually there, like Mr. Mm -hmm. Forbes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Cortland, so that way they can see, oh, 
okay, that was a leader back in the day. How can I contribute to that? What's the next step after that? And it's important to hear these stories. So I would just say keep keep voicing, keep ma making sure you watch news. I, like I'm interning at the GA and everything that I learned at the General Assembly, I'm bringing back to my institution because it's important. Yes. I'm, 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 I'm the bridge, you know, I'm, I'm the bridge and that's how I like to look at it. So please yes. always, always support HBCU, Shaw University, the motherland, you know, <laughs> who started it all for, for all HBCUs, if you ask me. But we have a lot to give, you know, and, and we love our institution and we want other people to love it too. Okay. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I am so thankful to have had all of you. You are welcome back anytime, anytime, however I can support Shaw University, I will do it. Um, some of you will be very interesting um, uh, uh, posts on other shows about uh, about some specific political issues as well. So Zaid Steele, somebody just left the chat. Say her name, Zaid Steele. That's right. All right. Okay. Well, Dr. Dillard, Zaid Steele, Mr. Cox and Dr. Forbes, thank you so, so much. And don't be a stranger. And you all, please share this video and please remember to support Shaw University on Juneteenth. You can do it before Juneteenth, okay? They'll take it anytime, but they're day of giving Juneteenth. Yes. Okay, let's wave off. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, everybody.